Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. So hello and welcome to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and with me today is Sarah Blacksmith. And Sarah is a general manager of motion control at Siemens Digital Industries, and her career with Siemens spans almost 20 years now. So she's also an industry advisor. She's a visiting fellow at Cranfield University. And hopefully, Sarah, we're talking honestly about her career highs yep. and her lows, about working as a leader in engineering, offering perhaps some inspiration, maybe some reassurance for those of you who are just figuring out your own careers. So Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I think for a bit of context, first of all, uh, Sarah, what is motion control for all of us here? Yes. Um, well, so, okay. So if I, if I maybe start with the digital industries bit, so uh, Siemens is a tech company. Um, so we sell hardware and software that helps, that helps factories and industry basically um, automate processes, be more competitive. Um, so yeah, one part of that is our motion control business unit, which is what I am responsible for. And so we um, have products that range from um, CNC controllers um, through to drives and inverters that con- basically control motion, control the output of the motor. Uh, so an example being um, baggage handling. So if any of you have been on holiday recently um, through one of the terminals in Manchester airports, for example, then um, our drives control the baggage um, handling system. So you, you get in your bag through the control of uh, drives, but uh, through the control of motors. Um, so it enables you to, to save energy, but also to obviously control the speed. So everything's not running at the same speed all the time. You, you're controlling the, the motor. So yeah, so it's a suite of, of products um, that, that I look after around, yeah, around those sort of two areas, really. So yeah, it's ace. And how many people are, are part of this? How many are in your wider team? Uh, so we've got um, 21 people in my business unit and then... There's, there's about 500 people in Siemens Digital Industries in Manchester at, well, and around the UK and Ireland. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that's one an interesting point in a way because it's not necessarily who I'm responsible for is just one tiny bit of it. And actually, it's the, the interface with all of the different areas that you need to be successful. So, um, you know, we've got our customer business center colleagues, we've got our sales colleagues, for example, and I need to be working well together with all of those people in order to be successful. It's not just about having, um, yeah, the people that are directly reporting in, into me. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, so it's interesting uh, dynamics to, and, and lots of different people to, to meet and, and um, yeah, and develop, develop good relationships with which I think is key in, in anywhere you're working. <laughs> and what are you working on at the moment, if, if you're allowed to tell us? What's in your entry in the week ahead? Um, it's, so a lot of my uh, work is, is working together with our partners. So we go to market with a number of different companies that are partnering with Siemens Digital Industries. Uh, so uh, so I'll be, I talk to those, those people quite a lot. Um, I'm going on, uh, we have one of our customers, BAE Systems, who manufacture um, defense um, equipment. Uh, so they're coming into our Congleton factory for a visit. So I'll be, uh, I'll be going over to support that and do an introduction. Um, so yeah, a mix of going in the office for, for visits and things, meeting with customers, uh, and then um, other topics around with our HQ, for example. I've got a call with our HQ to sort of uh, review our progress <laughs> and where we're up to, where we need support, um, and where we where we need to do uh, make improvements and things like that. So it's a bit of a, a mixed mixed bag of things. <laughs> and does that also give you commercial financial? responsibilities in the role as well. Yeah, so um I have two colleagues that that work alongside me uh who are responsible who are commercial partners if you like. Um but ultimately yeah, we've got I've got profit and loss responsibility for the business unit that I'm uh, that I look after. But 
a lot of it is done, like I say, with the support of of others. Um, you know, to to make sure that they could translate some of that for me and 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 help me make the right decisions, and that we can bring the right people in to make those decisions as well. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it spans quite a lot of stuff that, as it as the guest, the title which which uh, gives you general managers. There's a fair few bits to it, which I I've only been in this role for a year, and um, I moved from a manufacturing role. Uh, and so it was massively different coming into what's more of a sales um, and business unit lead role. So it was a big, big shock to the system <laughs> when I first moved. <laughs> I, th- I think it's something that we often surprise people with is that when we're talking to people in in engineering roles, those might be software, hardware engineering roles, that it it's it becomes far more than that. It becomes far more than being the engineer. It's about relationship building. There's yeah. commercial aspects. There's sales aspects to it. Yeah. Uh, as you say, P&L, so there's business leadership aspects to it. When you started out, is that sort of breadth of opportunity something you were aware of? No. When I started and when I originally picked what I was going to do at A-levels, it was completely based on wanting to become a mechanic in an F1 team. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I picked um, maths and physics at A-level and French. French bit was a bit random. Um, and yeah, so I, I picked those because I wanted to do mechanical engineering. Um because I thought that that was what I needed to do to be able to to bag one of those roles. Um, so yeah, then that didn't go to plan, but we can talk about that later. But um, yeah, so I, I really did not know uh, when I, part of the year in, I had to do a year in industry when I was at university and I joined Siemens um, at that point as an intern effectively. And uh, yeah, it was doing improvement, sort of lean manufacturing training with the shop floor teams. Uh, yeah, and so I, I was just sort of seeing seeing how it went. Really, <laughs> just I didn't really like. And I, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome. Well, I had a lot of that. You know, when you think like I don't actually know anything. You know, someone's going to figure out that they, they really know what I'm doing. So uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but yeah, you, you do you you do learn you do learn as you go along, don't you? And uh, you overcome some of that, and and then not in other times when you go into another new situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think surely imposter syndrome stays with all of us. It's just how much of it you feel at any one point yeah, in time. Totally. I think like, well, I mean, kudos to anyone that hasn't got it. And if so that is really self-assured because that that that's great, isn't it, as well? But um, yeah, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I, I completely worry that I, I don't know what I'm doing and yeah, that someone's gonna figure it out. But uh yeah, so I agree. I think everyone's got a bit of that, a bit of um nervousness in them that uh yeah they don't know when actually they do or if you don't know ask someone and uh, you know anyone will help uh certainly that's the the, the attitude and in, in where i work but yeah ask any questions and we'll we'll figure it out together so uh i'm all in for teamwork i'm not one of these i couldn't be an individual contributor you know just solely relying on you know doing your own thing i I'd much prefer, and everyone's different, but I, I much prefer working together in teams. Um, if we've got a big challenge or vice versa, but if we've got a big challenge, for example, say we've got a, you know, find some productivity savings in my last role, we always had really quite tough targets. I, I didn't tend to panic about it because I thought, well, we'll figure it out together. You know, <laughs> it's not all on me to figure it out because, um, yeah, we, that's why we've got everybody here so that we could all we could all work together. So yeah, there's always people around you that will be able to to help you if you, if you ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a, lo- a lot of all forms of engineering essentially problem solving and yeah. well problem identifying and then problem yeah. solving. And so most problems are better solved by a combination of the skill sets, the brains, the attitudes that come yeah. together and. That's what you call teamwork. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, that uh, when we did, um, I did a workshop with one of my colleagues in Colton when I worked there, a, a gentleman called Kevin Dooley. And he, I remember he said, fail is first attempt is learning. Because to, to your point as well, you're not going to problem solve any problem unless you have a go at it. Yeah, you'll fail. You'll learn something and then you'll try a different angle and then you'll fail. Or you, you know, it's about failing quickly, learning quickly and, and moving on. So embrace the failure. Something good will come of it. And so trying to think, I know that's not easy in me. Uh, so when I went to you, when I got my A-level result, 
I did shockingly bad. Like I did really well in my GCSEs and then I did the A-levels and it just did not go well. So anyone that doesn't have a great A-level result, don't panic, even though I totally panicked at the time. And that's the first <laughs> reaction, isn't it? And I went into clearing and I, I did get a spot on a manufacturing engineering degree at Loughborough um, and then went on, uh, you know, and it was all it was all fine. But at the time, I thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> As you do, don't you? Then it's sort of like, it took me on a different track. But I think, yeah, you meet di- different people then, you've got different opportunities and okay, it might not be what you thought you, it was going to be in the first instance, but often nothing is. So, <laughs> no, yeah. no. So, how did you find university? Actually, I mean, you know, a lot of people go to university now. Certainly, yeah. considerably more go to university now than than when when I did. And was it a place of uh, of working really hard for you, of playing really hard? Loughborough is known for its sport yeah, as well. Yeah. How did you find that whole experience of of being at university? Yeah, it was ace. I, I did love Loughborough, and I wasn't hugely sportive at forty at the time. Uh, and notoriously, the Loughborough clubs are extremely difficult to get into because everyone is at is either county or national level, which I wasn't. But um, so yeah, it was, but. The engineering side of things, like they'd literally just opened the Walson School of Engineering there and it was this brand new building. So we were walking, this is in 2000, which is like forever ago, isn't it? Um, then, uh, so we, we, I remember walking in the paint, you could still sell the paint. It was like the queen must have felt whenever she walked in anyway. <laughs> it was like a lick of paint. And then, but yeah, love, love for those days. And I work better with structured learning. So I, and then again, it's totally fine if you don't. You know, the amount of opportunities now for apprenticeships, which are brilliant, um, is huge. But yeah, for me, structured learning, it helps me. And the more theoretical side first, um, it is good, it's good for me. But yeah, I did, I did a BNG, a bachelor's undergraduate degree um, with a year in industry. And I, I would recommend if, you, if anyone gets an opportunity to do an internship or to do a year in industry, like that's definitely a good plan because it's always like um a year-long interview um but not that you have to be panicked by that it's just <laughs> you know be yourself and do a good job and and be enthusiastic and you know and you, people will see that in you um so yeah I was offered to um be sponsored for my final year and onto the graduate program um which again I didn't even go on to in the end I joined but then I, I an opportunity came up and so it goes back to especially now you know, things go off at tangents now. If you get an opportunity, you know, go for it. It's not, there's not so much set career pathway, I don't think, anymore. Than, um, and so going and trying different things, you know, you're only going to learn something and you're going to meet new people and potentially more opportunities and different opportunities will come from that. So, yeah, I definitely say don't think that your career is set. Like I thought, oh, God, I didn't get my A-levels at the end of the world. It wasn't, you know. Then I, I went to do an internship effectively and then went on a different path to what I actually thought. So, yeah, it's the, you know, be completely open to um, try different different stuff, I would say. Embrace embrace it. You can always change your mind and do something different later anyway, can't you? <laughs> and now you've been, at, you've been at Siemens in a number of different roles, but you've been there for, I think, around or almost 20 years. And, yeah. and if somebody stays in an organisation that long, something's working for them it's yeah. almost the opposite of why do people leave companies they leave because there's a lack of opportunity they leave because the culture's not right for them they leave yeah. because they're just not treated in or in a way that is right for them what are the positive pieces of of siemens that have have meant you've kept staying and moving into new roles i think uh definitely one is the opp- opportunities that you can get if you uh, i think take ownership of your own career so nobody's going to do it my advice would be nobody's going to do it for you. Make those connections with different people, learn different things, say yes to things and and, and look for opportunities and, and ask questions and, and be enthusiastic. So I think if you do that, definitely in Siemens, that, that's a great way to go. And But the culture for me, I I, I really like the, the openness, the, um, you know, I, I call it, we introduced something a while back called ownership culture and it was where, yeah, just taking ownership of your career, taking ownership of, um, if you're thinking about it as if it's your own company, then you're going to make the right decisions. So that that's the way that that people want you or that Siemens wants you to to be thinking, do, do the right thing. Um, so yeah, there's a high, 
level of giving people ownership. So a bit of autonomy, which I think is great. Um, but it's really inclusive place to work as well. So uh, th there's a lot of support available for, for different groups of, of people. Um, we've got a lot of employee networks. Uh, and yeah, you it, it's really, you can give feedback quite openly. Uh, in uh, And that, that's not always the case, is it? It's, I mean, some people have their challenges to give feedback to, but generally it's it's a place where people are open to new ways of doing things. They're open to um, receiving feedback, which I think is key to make sure that we don't have a blame culture, which I've seen, are, you, you know, you see in, or you hear of things in, in different companies. And I think if if we're, it's, what we need to be doing is, is creating a safe space in our company, which I, I believe we have, so that we're not looking around us thinking we've got to protect ourselves from the people within the business. Um, we're looking outwards thinking, right, you know, how do we make ourselves as competitive as possible? How do we make a difference in society? And how do we solve some of these biggest challenges that, that, that we can help contribute towards? Um, so, yeah, I think creating a safe space to work is probably one of the main things if I was to have gibbered on. But, but, so that was, I think, like, I think if uh, if I was to pick one out, it's I feel like it's a safe place to work where you can be yourself, like you can bring your whole self, um, you can bring your whole self to work and yeah, and enjoy working here. So yeah, it's really and good. So much better engineering is making things better, yeah. and and they 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 hopefully then leak through into the world for the rest of us, just yeah. going about our lives and just almost to illustrate how how work makes a difference, how your work makes a difference. So there are things that are in the rest of our lives that you've just, your work runs through to and makes things better, makes things better quality, faster, cheaper. You mentioned earlier um, baggage control yeah, at yeah. Manchester Airport and everyone has good stories and, and a few people have horror stories about yeah. baggage control and airports. But but what are you thinking, do you know what, I, I made a difference there, my team made a difference. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think I would... It, Probably because I've spent more time in manufacturing, I, I feel that one, if you're we one using our own technology within the factory, if if you ever been to Congleton, so if everyone, if anyone, I hadn't heard of Congleton before I started working there eleven years ago, um, but it's just forty minutes south of Manchester, and with one of our factories is is based in Congleton. There's about five hundred people work there, and it's we in that factory class ourselves as you know trying to manufacture Siemens portfolio using Siemens portfolio. So i.e. we're utilizing our own tech wherever possible to, you know, to, to give ourselves the advantage that all of our customers get. Um so and and through using that, you make yourself more efficient and more productive. And ultimately what for me, what it's all about is remaining competitive, keeping manufacturing in the UK and giving people keeping those five hundred people in in a job. Um, for generations to come. That factory's been there for um, 1971, it was established. So what's that? So I'm crap at maths, believe it or not. Um, like 50 odd years. Yeah. And we want it to be there for another 50 odd years, making, you know, the latest portfolio of of drives and inverters. Um, and so for, for me, it's it's making UK PLC as competitive as, pros as possible. Um, so if that's putting an inverter on on a motor or drive on a motor that makes it more efficient, that means your energy costs are being reduced, which means then you're paying less for energy, which in today's prices, every little, you know, can, can go a, a long way. Um, whether it's automating parts of factories, so... Um, but, you know, there's a lot of port of the portfolio that, that we sell in, in DI where, you know, you're making, you're able then to automate things um, that, that people then don't have to spend time on. And then they can spend time on more valuable, um, you know, value adding parts that, you know, parts of their role that they need to work on. Um, or they can save money on the processes, which reduces costs to the end users, you know, of, of whatever it is that they're manufacturing. But again, it's, it's keeping you know, a sustainable business and, you know, making us in the UK as profitable and as competitive as possible so that we keep keep manufacturing here. Um, we keep jobs for all of the fantastic people that are listening to this podcast um, and make sure there's a great future for you, the UK to be, to be making things because it's really important. And, you know, you saw in COVID where it was highlighted our lack of manufacturing ability in certain areas and you know, there's there's a huge opportunity for us to grow 
the manufacturing industry and some fantastic people and amazing opportunities for engineers and potential engineers of the future to 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 join us and 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 uh, yeah keep keep the UK a fantastic place to work um, which I think it is we come up with fantastic innovations and um, new ways of doing things like you, you mentioned before so. Yeah, we just need to, we need to keep doing that. We need to keep putting new tech in, whichever whoever's tech it might be, you know, and whoever working together to solve some of these big problems. But yeah, I'm keen on UK manufacturing. <laughs> I, I think that interestingly connects to a question that we had sent in by one of our listeners, a, a career starter themselves, which is that in a in a competitive and technology driven field. How do you and your team actually stay at the forefront of innovation? Um, I mean, for us in the region, we're more of a sales app um, function. But ultimately, even in sales, it's about thinking, right, how can we do things differently? How do we need to change our messaging? And, um, you know, what new new technologies are coming out from our HQ that, that we can say, right, what's the value in this to our customers? Um, but but from, a, from a manufacturing point of view, it's... Um, I mean, in in our Congleton factory, if I take it for example, we've got an innovations manager um, who, who whose sole job it is to look at, you know, make sure that one we're creating an environment where people can be creative. So the R and D team in in Congleton has Fridays, like not off, but um, they have like fun Fridays where they just you know do different activities, try and stimulate different ways of doing things, so that you you come up with new ways of new ways of thinking um and and similarly with with the manufacturing teams it's i mean it's a bit more controlled because you sort of you're working within processes that need to be approved um but yeah putting people in those different scenarios and different uh, ways that they wouldn't normally work so that you could try and stimulate right well you know move, let's move people around so that you can see a new process that's ne- not a new process a process that's brand new to your eyes and see well okay does what we're doing here make sense? Like, is there any ways that you would, you know, that you'd look at it and go, why on earth are we doing it like that? We can cut that bit out completely and we can we can start again. So I, I think it's, as, as always with me, it tends to come back to the people. Like, are you creating an environment where people can be creative, where they can think differently, where they're not, um, where you're protecting people from any pressures that they might be coming from, you know, from HQ? Um, and that you you've got that environment where people feel safe again, where, where they because ultimately if we don't feel safe, we're, we're not going to be creative because we're going to be too worried about the things that are going on on around us and not be able to focus on on doing something different um, and, and thinking of new ways of of working. Does that answer your question? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> no, I I know that one of the and and this links into to what you're saying. I know one of your your passions and mission almost is to to get more women and girls into engineering. What do you let's start with your what are you doing about that at the moment? What do you get involved with? Yeah, so I mean we we run different sessions um with uh, for example our Siemens mobility team do a lot of having days where we bring um you know girls from different universities in uh, and we run sessions so I've I've been involved in in a number of those um Similarly, we have a lot of competitions, not just for girls, but but for students coming from from universities. And there's a lot more girls than there used to be, which is fantastic. Um, so helping to sort of, I, I do like you know do intros and stuff, and then as a as a mentor for quite a few people as well. So I do like do quite a lot of mentoring for different again, not just for, for women, but for, for men as well. Um, but I think it's interesting because Mark Wood is our our. Um, our, our school and, and community manager in Siemens um, PLC, and it, we've definitely moved more now. Instead of just running all girl events, that it's actually the take up is better if you if you run it uh, the, where anyone can come. Um, obviously, then still focus on trying to get more girls, more women to to join the sessions and things. Um, so yeah, we started to to try and move more to that way rather than having having it specific like that um we've got women's network that i'm a member of uh again we run different sessions for supporting um supporting everyone again but uh, but so but but focusing on how we can actively support females and women in in our company um yeah and in the past i'm in the past we've run like when i was at congleton we used to run like this 
just explosion exercise about, you know, just like activities where we'd get girls in and, you know, talk them through about what careers are open to you. What are they interested in doing? You know, what would a career in, in engineering or in manufacturing look like? Um, so, yeah, there's a rough, and, I guess. And if that's what, that's just a, a small bit of what you're doing personally, a small bit of what Siemens are doing overall. We know that across the UK, and you are quite sort of strong almost in your, in your passion for, for UK manufacturing, UK PLC and that side of things. There are statistics report from government sector otherwise saying that we're going to be well over 100,000 short in terms of the number of engineers that we need just in the next few years. And an engineering is, it still has a reputation for, and statistically it is quite quite male dominated, yeah. quite white male dominated. What do you think needs to happen at a, at a, a bigger level, a sector level, even a government level to to encourage more young people to go down a path which is going to lead them into these sort of sectors? Um, I mean, personally, I feel like the more role models that we can highlight, the better, you know, because, and that's then, but it's also when you're, when you're talking about schools and careers advice for, for, kid, for kids, it's like you mentioned before, you know, it's not fantastic, but but even in the school, it, it, so I think it's one, it's partly government, but what it's, it's partly companies companies going in, partnering with schools and making them aware of what is available, what what could a career look like for you in engineering, but doing that a lot earlier. So I, I can't remember where I, I heard it, but, you know, almost down to primary school level, that if you, you know, you, you have to get, get to kids really early um, to, to sort of influence where they, they'll see themselves, uh, you know, to influence because there's so many bloody stereotypes, isn't there? Now, like there, there are, like you know, we still got it in the language that we use. It's almost as a doctor, you think it's a male straight away, don't you? Because it's been ingrained. Like I even think like that because you just you're so used to it. So part of it is cultural, and and all of us recognizing the language that we're using, and you know that we that we don't automatically assume that an engineer equals a man, and that when we're talking to really young kids, that that we you know get rid of the genders when we're talking about any role um, and not not just an engineering one. Um, so yeah, I think starting really early at, at schools, putting engineering, you know, front and center, all of the STEM side of things, like right from that younger year. This is my personal view. So like, is anyone listening for all the schools and that? But, um, but yeah, because when you go into schools, I think we've had examples where you offer to provide, for example, equipment for doing different things, but the teachers then don't know how to use them. So if they don't know how to use them, you could donate as much equipment as you like, but it ain't going to get used because they'll, they'll, it's like any of us, if you don't know how to do something and you've not been shown, you'll just be like, oh, we'll just leave that on the shelf over there. And if said anyone eventually does know how to use it, then we'll, you know, so it's making sure that it's not just equipment, it's it's putting in place the training, the mentoring for the teachers that are in the schools, as well as, um, yeah, putting in all of the right, uh, the right courses and the right, um, just showing people what's available at a really young age and influencing that and getting to the parents as well, because they also, it's going to take ages to change the, the culture. I was talking to a lady in whose background, she comes from, I think it's Iran, um, and in Iran, um, or was it? It might be Afghanistan. It was. I think it was Iran. But one of the uh, this country that she came from, the norm was that there was no gender assigned to any role. So everyone, women in the, in, you know, they they would look to 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 do any of the same roles that men would typically um, apply for or decide to go for. Uh, whereas obviously in this country, it's completely different, isn't it? We're so used. To, I mean, anyone can apply for different stuff now, but. If an industry, you know, like construction, like engineering is just completely full of men and that's your automatic bias is that that's a man's job. Um, and lots of people in these industries still probably think that, then it makes it really difficult to, one, encourage anyone to go into it. And then when they get into it, the few people that do go into it are still experiencing those biases. Then it's it's not really a place where you feel safe, is it? <laughs> Uh, have have you had to have you had to face up to that sort of bias at any point? I, um, I mean, you have instances of of things. I think, at, by and large, I, 
seems a great place to work. But ultimately, there are peak pockets of people anywhere, aren't there? That um, you know don't yeah don't do things in the in the right way. I, I mean, there was one instance I was over in in Germany, and someone was shaking everybody's hand. And it, it was a big bu- big group of blokes, and I was the only woman, and he didn't shake my hand. And I don't know if that was because, one, he thought I was a secretary, in which case, though, why would you not shake someone's hand anyway that was that? And and I remember it to this day because it, it annoys you now. I'd say a different word then, but I won't because we're on a podcast. Um, but, I mean, that's a small instance, but it makes you feel excluded. It makes you feel like you're not part of the, the gang. and And so you think, yeah, it doesn't really make you feel good about yourself and you don't, I mean, I, I didn't say anything because again, it's difficult to, isn't it? And well, I probably would now and <laughs> I'd put my hand out and be like, hi, I'm Sarah. <laughs> but you say small incident now, it it obviously was a small incident because no. it's still very it much stuck me, in your head. Yeah. And, and if you're talking also about younger girls, young women looking at entry points to different careers and that one little thing happens that somebody may not even notice that they did. No. Yeah. That, that can be enough for trigger to say, forget it. I I, I don't want to go down that route. So yeah. there are many, there are many cultural um issues that do just put stoppers on younger students saying, I'm I'm not that type of person. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not maths i I'm not engineer It's just they rule things out like that, let alone if they come across rude. Yeah, exactly. Idiots, like you met. Um, but I think if, if, just to touch upon what you said there about, um, I, I think, you know, if someone thinks like, oh, I'm not mathsy, then I was reading, I read this book by Carol Dweck and Seamus has gone all in for the growth, growth mindset. And, but it really hit home for me because it's like that where you are now is just the beginning. You can learn anything that you want to. And it, it's all about putting the effort in. It's all about asking people for help. Um, yeah, and, and having that passion and, and, and throwing yourself into it and, and not thinking, right, skills that I have right now, oh, they're the things that I'm good at and so that's what I've got to do. Actually thinking, okay, there's something over there that you don't know anything about, but if you put your mind to it and you fail and you keep going and you try a different way and you fail, yeah, and you, you learn something and then you keep going, then you can do whatever you want. So, but, but you've got to put the effort in, you've got to ask for help. Um, and be willing to, yeah, you know that okay, you are going to fail at some stuff, but if you keep putting the effort in, then you'll you'll get there. You'll um, so. It's, but I only discovered that like, like, like oh, not that I was. But when I read that book, I was like, oh, because there's so many ways, and I totally recommend the book because she talks about how kids, how parents talk to their children. So, um, I, uh, for example, um. God, I can't think of an example now, I've got to say it. But like, yeah, it's just, it's not praising the outcome. It's praising the effort. So say someone does a great a picture, but they, you know, they spent a lot of time doing it. You know, instead of saying, Mark, what a brilliant, amazing picture. Everyone's going to love that. You know, that could sell a, a gallery. It's so fantastic. Um, actually, Mark, that is amazing. The amount of effort that you must have put in to that, you know, it's amazing that you've just gone back to it. You've tweaked. You've seen that you could get maybe a different shading over here and then you've thought about it and then you've gone back to it again and you've really worked so hard at that. And the difference between those, you know, whereas like you might have come away from the first one thinking, oh my God, art, I have to be good at art. Art is the main thing that I am good at because someone's told me I'm good at it, you know, and I had a really good result there. Um, But actually it was the effort that you put it, you know, if you praise the effort, you can apply that to anything else. but yeah, yeah. So I really like. I love that way of thinking, which yeah wasn't my way of thinking before. I had a great. <laughs> and what what skills then do you think you've got now um, that you've developed since your Loughborough University days that maybe you, you didn't think you'd either need or didn't think you were skilled in that area? Yeah, I think pe- people skills. So being able to develop relationships with people, being able to gives constructive and effective feedback that if people can master that or work really hard on that, it would serve you no end because no matter where you go in wherever business, whatever industry, ultimately you're dealing with people uh, and you're developing relationships with people and um, you need to be able to communicate well um, and, you know, admit when you're wrong. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think 
a lot of the times, like one of the things I've learned over the way is, is I'll take the blame for stuff because a lot of the times, you know, people end up arguing about things and I'm like, look, we can blame me. If we can move on, that'd be fantastic. And let's get to the actual fundamental bit, which is how can we solve the problem and how can we make ourselves better? Um, you, you know, let's not spend time arguing about who was to blame um, unless something, you know, we're getting to the root cause of it. Yeah, I definitely want to do that because then we can improve and we can learn. Um, but yeah, so I'd say, yeah, effective communication, being able to give feedback is so important. Um, yeah, I, I think they're the main ones, working with people and figuring out that you have to um, be different in different situations. So it, it depends. Everyone's different. So you have to have that situational awareness. You can't just go into every meeting or every scenario and be, be exactly the same. You have to figure out the room. You have to figure out who you're working with. How do they best work? Um, and figuring out yourself. How do you work best? Um, what what works for you and what doesn't? But be open about that and communicate it. And then you can figure it out with those people and give them feedback and be open to receiving feedback. Because I think when most of us hear the words like, oh, you know, can we have a chat? I need to give you some feedback. Like, just dredge. Bills do, doesn't it? You're like, oh my sweet life, what is this gonna be? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick meeting, quick catch up. You're like, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> yeah. And do you think there are, you know, do you think if your 20 year old self could see you now, do you think there are things they would be surprised by in in a good way? I think more confident than I was then. You know, I think when you're younger, well, maybe not as many people now, but like when I was younger, yeah, I wasn't confident in myself. And part of that comes with you get experience, don't you? And, um, but yeah, believing that you can do it. Um, if you put the work in, if you, if you, um, ask people for help. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah. Oh my God. Can't believe she's more, con well, not fully confident. There's always something, isn't there? Like we said, but yeah. I am a lot more confident um, than than I used to be. Anyway, <laughs> and are you still following the the F one that got you, you know interested what? in the first place? I took a dip when there was no overtaking, so there was a period in F one where there was just no overtaking. And anyway, in the last year, my husband Colin and I have, have really got back into it. So yeah, like I because I, I used to go all the time. I used to go to Silverstone Grand Prix. Me and my sister. Um, and then I just lost interest and then, um, yeah, we've picked it up in the last year. So, uh, not, we're all, me and we're big Alonso fans at the moment, <laughs> like rooting for Aston Martin all the time. <laughs> so yeah, it's good. Cool. Yeah. And, and Lewis Hamilton, of course, has set up, uh, an initiative over the last couple of years to try and encourage people from certainly less represented communities in, in F1 to, yeah. To understand about opportunities and and career pathways, and so there are there are so many organisations mm -hmm. and and companies trying to to show actually how routes into engineering in all of its forms, yeah. software engineering, hardware engineering, yeah, everything around that can can be a fascinating route to take because it's not just about being the more scientifically sort of focused engineer it's yeah. it's about as you do now it's it's commercial skills it's people skills you're doing selling at the moment you're doing business leadership as well yeah. so it 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 encompasses pretty much everything you could want to do once you got that platform yeah. and you're generally going to fix problems and make things better yeah as well exactly yeah and, definitely. and if if anything then from what are the real highlights for you? What are the, the the sort of one or two things you're just thinking, that was a great moment or that was a huge success for the team? Um, I mean, when, when I was in Congleton, we won a global Werner von Siemens Award. Uh, for, and, and it was like a culmination of probably like six years work of tra transforming the factory, bringing in a lot more digital tools um, and automation, robotics. So that was really nice because it was a nice recognition for all of the team um, for all the hard work because it, it is hard work a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, it, it's nice to get that global sort of, you know, it's not easy to win a global Siemens Award. And, yeah, so to be part of that was lovely because it was nice recognition for everybody that was involved. And it also helped cement our place from a UK manufacturing facility as you know, we're we're part of this bigger network that that's achieved, um, you know, 
yeah, this huge program of works um, and, and done it in collaboration with our Chinese factory uh, and and the German factory um, that's in our network as well. So so that was really uh, that that was really nice. It was just a nice, um, but yeah, like so many different things, but, but a lot more around yeah around the people in Congleton because they're just. Um, fantastic it's such a nice group of people there not that they're not in Manchester I just don't know them as well <laughs> um but but yeah in in Congleton it, you know just people are willing to go the extra mile though it, it's what makes up that factory is the fact that people care that there's generations of families that work there they want there to be a factory in there for, for the next generation of their families that work there and and so, yeah, there's so many different times like that we've all pulled together to, you know, to pull things out of the bag, to make sure that we're, you know, spending all the capital that we've got, to um, that we're getting stuff out the door on time for our customers, and and yeah, so people all about all all the people in Hogleton are just awesome. I I think Sarah, what you've done is in in our conversation now is you've painted a fascinating picture of what working in engineering is actually like in contrast to what so many people might think it like it's yeah. like because the words you've used uh, are about people they're about creativity they're about innovation they're about teams not necessarily all the things that people are going to think of when yeah. they think of maybe a bloke in a hard hat and <laughs> and so i think it's 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 just wonderfully enlightening and refreshing for people to listen and go actually there are so many opportunities here and and you said something as well about you can learn anything you want to and i think that is probably uh the message i would take away most of all from this it's been oh, good. really interesting to listen to you there, there is one final question which you know i'm going to ask yeah. really which is about carrying this this baton of careers insight forward and if there's one other person you could you could recommend who if we can unwrap their career story it would be really interesting to listen to yeah i would uh i would totally recommend uh dr megan ronane uh she works for innovate uk um and she's really inspiring uh so she leads one of the teams around manufacturing and, and materials i think it's her title um so yeah she's definitely uh an, an inspiring person that would be w well worth the chat Brilliant. Thank you. Sarah, it's so uh, nice to have met you today. Thank you for your time. It's been really interesting and lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.